Today's JJ Reddick podcast is brought to you by the new Showtime sports documentary series, Shut Up and Dribble. This three-part television event from executive producers LeBron James and Maverick Carter explores 60 years of politics, race, pop culture, and pro basketball, proving it was never just a game. Shut Up and Dribble starts streaming this Saturday only on Showtime. Give it a watch. Welcome to this week's episode of the JJ Reddick Podcast. I have a very special guest for you. She is Chrissy Houlihan. She is running for Congresswoman here in the 6th Congressional District in the state of Pennsylvania. She is a Philadelphia native, a big Sixers fan, and has a lot of fun stuff to say. To provide a little background, uh, Chrissy went to Stanford for undergrad. She went to MIT and got her master's. She was also in the Air Force. She ran and won apparel company for a number of years. She did Teach for America, and then she started a successful for-profit literacy program. Chrissy is obviously a fantastic candidate. She's running uh, for the Democratic seat. And I want to just preface this whole conversation with saying I am not here to vilify anyone or any political party. Um, I think anyone who has listened to this podcast knows that uh, I am a Democrat. I am a liberal. That's sort of how I identify in politics. Um, Chrissy uh, just seems like a very fascinating person and a fascinating uh, congressional candidate. And I wanted to chat with her. And because she's local, we made this happen. And uh, I hope you enjoy our conversation. Without further ado, my conversation with Chrissy Houlihan. Chrissy, thank you so much for coming on the pod. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It seems uh, unlikely that if you had looked back a couple years ago that you and I would be sitting here two weeks before election Tuesday, you as a candidate, me as an NBA player, and me interviewing you on my podcast. It's it's highly unlikely. <laughs> Virtually impossible, yes. <laughs> By this point in time, I will have uh, given uh, our listeners some background on you, but just provide us with sort of, uh, you know, your background into sure. becoming, sure. Um, a po- you know, a first-time politician. Sure. And you're absolutely right. In in a million, jillion years, I would have never thought that I would be sitting here speaking to you about running for office of any form, let alone for U.S. Congress. Um, My life has been a rather eclectic one over the 30 years or so of my adulthood. I've done a lot of things, um, in my opinion, in service in one form or another. But most of those things have been very much behind the scenes and back of office and back of show. And so uh, I had been, for those 30 years following my family business. My dad and my grandfather were career military officers. I joined the military right after Stanford. I had a ROTC scholarship, uh, went in and worked and worried about anti-ballistic missile defense programs because that was what we worried about in the late 80s and early 90s. Got out of the military, did a graduate degree in engineering at MIT, and then came down to our community. And I've lived here in the suburbs of Philadelphia for 25 years, growing up my family and starting a bunch of businesses with a bunch of college buddies of mine. Uh, one of them that was actually a basketball apparel and footwear company called And One Basketball. I served there as their chief operating officer uh, for that entire run up and until the sale of the company. Following that, I had the opportunity to uh, worry about corporate social responsibility and, and taking the lessons that we learned from the sale of And One and realizing that for-profit businesses could be run differently and better and could take care of the planet and the community and employees in addition to taking care of profits did that for a period of time. And then for the last five or six years, I actually was uh, based here in Camden and Philadelphia at a variety of other different areas, worrying about education, uh, thinking about the challenge of next generation to make sure that our kids have the tools that they need to be able to learn and then to be successful citizens in our in our country. And I did that first by teaching at Simon Gratz. I was a, a 
chemistry teacher at Simon Gratz in North Philly, and then by running an organization that focused on early childhood literacy, pre-K through fourth grade kids, and making sure that they could read. Um, And so that was my journey. And as I mentioned, kind of thought that I was moving the needle in the things that mattered serving, protecting, and defending, you know, growing good businesses or educating our kids, and that politics and the government were for other humans, other creatures. <laughs> uh, and that really changed for me, you know, um, two years ago, almost exactly, uh, the evening of our most recent presidential election, where for the very first time, I really became gravely concerned about what we had just said to one another about the democracy and about kind of our commonly held ideals of Freedom. I'm happy to share with you my personal uh, experiences the night of the election, but that's. I'm very curious about them. Because, well, the reason I would like to hear about them is because I grew up in what I would describe as a conservative household. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My three most memorable election nights, well, obviously 2008 when Obama was elected. The other two were 1992. I can remember sitting around watching the results come in when Clinton defeated the first Bush president. And, um, Overhearing my parents talking about, you know, this country's going to hell, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. Thinking I was going to wake up the next day and go to school and everything would just be different. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, of course, 2016. Mm -hmm. I I very vividly remember being at dinner with one of my best friends, Ben Winston, uh, in Los Angeles. And, you know, we're reading everything. And I didn't get a spark to go serve. I didn't get a spark to go run for office, which you clearly did. So what was so visceral about that night and that moment that that, that caused that? So it was a, a bunch of things that sort of came together, but one of them is, and I, like you, I'm I was raised in not a conservative family, but in a very uh, uh, military family, respectful of the political process, respectful of the democratic process. When the people speak, you salute smartly and you honor the commander in chief and you serve. Uh, and this time felt very, very different. And here's some of the reasons why. Um, that evening, I had just knocked doors with my daughter. I have two daughters um, who are now grown and out of the house. Um, Uh, And I had knocked doors. We sat down to celebrate what we thought would be a historical moment, the first woman elected to the presidency. And of course, that didn't happen. And that's okay, right? But this time, it just didn't feel okay in the same way. This wasn't about party or politics or policies. This was about the way we treat one another. Uh, And the reason why it was particularly personal is that my daughter's gay. And she was very, very worried after the election, immediately after the election, that we had really just said something very terrifying to her community and to communities like hers. And she spent the kind of week after the election as a 24-year-old unwilling to go back to an adult life. You know, And I thought that was pretty worrisome as as the mom of a 24-year-old person. Um, And similarly, my dad came into town that same week. Um, My dad was a Navy captain, retired Navy captain, but he also came here as a survivor of the Holocaust. He was five when he came here as a a refugee, a religious refugee, and he cried at the results of the election. Uh, My Navy captain, 74-year-old dad, you know, is in tears, worried about building out basements, you know, to hide people and worried about whether he would be a refugee again. And uh, when your dad and your daughter are both crying, you know, that's, you know, that's the problem. And that's a a wake up call in a different way than I had ever felt before. Um, My analogy for people is in my part of the military, I worried about satellite imagery. And when two satellites are telling you that something is true on the ground, that it's ground truth, it's called dual phenomenology. And when my two satellites were telling me that we were in a very different time, that this wasn't just mm-hmm. another election, um, that was a real call to action for me. And when I thought about how I could be helpful, um, I realized that I had experience in serving a variety of different ways and that it would be helpful to possibly bring this diversity of experience to the table um, at this really critical uh, time for the country. When you made the decision to run, I I, th- I believe I read somewhere that you sent in um, like basically a question to a website, like yep. what what do I need to know yep. to run, or what are the yeah. qualifications to yeah. run? Yeah, and I find this really interesting because it's something that I think about a lot when in in reference to athletes and NBA players, and you know, there's there's once there's there there seems to be this like separation of like, we can or can't be political, right? Mm -hmm. And like, Mm -hmm. you have to have certain qualifications to speak out on a topic. When really we're all just human, right? And we all sort of share in the same experiences and that's part of what makes us all human. So what are the qualifications? It sounds to me like 
yeah. there are none. You I, can just I, run. I think you, yeah, I think that's yeah. the answer that I definitely got back is if not me, why not me, you know? And yeah. I think that, yeah, I absolutely did. I did a bunch of things right after the, the election to try and understand if I was qualified or not. And in my family with my girls, as I was raising them, there was a mantra that we would give them, which is sort of highest, best use and think about the things you know how to do and elevate them to the highest and best thing that would be useful with those skills. And when I was trying to figure out in this really important inflection point for our nation, what would be the highest and best thing that I could be doing, it occurred to me that I could run for office. But you're right, I had no idea, like, what does a human do when they want to run for office? And so I did. I got a, um, a solicitation from an organization called Emily's List, which is uh, an organization that tries to get Democratic women elected to office who are pro-choice. And I give $10 a month to them every month. And they send me an email every day that asks for a dollar more or $3 more. And so I hit reply to that and attached my resume amongst other things that I did on the days following the election and just said, I don't know if I'm the right set of pe- qualifications, but could you tell me what you think? And oddly enough to that random email to info at, you know, they, <laughs> they got the email and they wrote me back. And that was one of the many things that was helpful in re- making me realize that I was qualified. That's amazing. Beyond that, obviously you have to, you have to raise money. Mm. You have to campaign. Mm-hmm. There's also, I believe there was a Supreme Court state ruling that sort of did away with gerrymandering. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the dis- re- district lines were mm-hmm. redrawn. Mm-hmm. There's also a wave of women running yep. for office. Yep. I think seven of the eight women, new women that are running in the state are from the Democratic Party. So there's all these things that are sort of also working in your favor. So a lot of it, I, you know, is your qualifications, your experience, um, a life of, of service and, and timing. Mm-hmm. No, there's a lot to that, to the, what you just said to unpack. You know, I've been running for Congress now for, I've just calculated 633 days and I have 11 more days to go. And sure, did not have any idea that all of those things would happen and unfold over the course of almost two years of, of doing this. And you're right. Um, the landscape has shifted out from under, you know, there's a different district, there's a different opponent in this particular race. Um, but one of the things, I can't remember which which uh, general, uh, Chinese general, as I recall, said something about war, which is the best wars are fought somehow before they're even, you know, brought to the battlefield. And sometimes just by being entrepreneurial enough and zealous enough uh, that you, you know, throw yourself into this as hard as you can, as fast as you can, you manage to clear the field, you know. You know, and that's effectively what we've we've been able to do over the last nearly two years of, of running. Um, and I think that it really is interesting to learn what it takes to run for office. I never actually understood that people who run for office are are doing it for such a long time with such intensity, with such a huge team. Um, I always was one of those people who watched the election results the evening of and just watched the little heads at the bottom of the screen <laughs> and like the little check boxes of like right. blue check, green check, you know, red check. Um, and I didn't realize that some person had put their heart and soul into this for the last two years, four years or whatever. How, how big is your team? So How many people? what one I'm uncomfortable being a candidate for Congress, but because this is effectively an enterprise that you know you build over the the better yeah. part of two years, uh, I was very comfortable with the idea of building a team that would have one mission, which was to succeed and to win and to represent the people, and a largely probably a four million dollar enterprise. You know when it when it all comes down to it. So my team right now rested about five full time folks, and it sort of grew from my dog up until you know five people, yeah. uh, and it also is probably a half a dozen. Cons- consultants of one form or another that are helping. And then, frankly, there are 85, 90,000 individual people who have given and contributed of their time and their treasure over the last, um, you know, nearly two years to elevate this race and to make it a really important conversation. That's amazing. Um, before we talk more politics, I want to go back and talk a little bit about your time at An One because <laughs> it is relevant to the basketball and my, my profession in the NBA. So I was, uh, I was in high school. <laughs> and and one was very popular, and you and your husband, I I, mm-hmm. I believe you guys grew, grew the business from like four million in revenue to like two hundred and fifty million in mm-hmm. revenue. You actually carved out a pretty significant market share. The and one mixtape was like a viral thing before there were viral yep, things. Before there was <laughs> before, reality TV. Before, before some reality that, TV yeah. and social media, yeah. um, and. You know, I'm I'm curious. What do you think led to that success? Because 
you're seeing it now, um, kind of come full full circle now with and one New Balance, um, the Chinese companies. I'm forgetting one Puma are now all trying to get back into mm-hmm. this into mm-hmm. the sneaker world, mm-hmm. specifically with basketball. Mm-hmm. And Nike and Adidas just have this huge sort of monopoly over the, the the NBA world. So what do you think it was? Yeah, so it was actually kind of really a remarkable journey. My husband and I did come and join a group of college buddies of ours, one who had actually gone to school here in this area at, at Wharton, one who had gone to school out west with us. And they were best friends from high school up in New York, and they started and won. And they collected a group of us uh, around them who had interests and passions in the things that a growing business needed to have. I was the operations person. Uh, if you could see me, you would now see that I'm, I'm five foot five and I'm a relatively slight person. I do not play basketball. Um, I was asked to join the company to worry about the business of the business and to think about the back office stuff. Other people joined the company who had other passions and, and, and abilities. And we had this really kind of abiding law, which is like the team with the most superstars wins. Uh, and the, and, you know, best idea wins. And so by growing a company basically full of a bunch of 20-somethings where we'd never done anything like this, we knew nothing about t-shirts, apparel, shoes, you know, everything. None of those things we knew anything about. I think it actually permitted us to be able to uh, to innovate and to be able to say, well, why can't we do it that way? Rather than, you know, joining a much more state and, and uh, solid organization like a Nike or an Adidas or something like that. So it was just a really cool journey with a bunch of friends. Um, and we still to this day work together. Uh, you, I think, interviewed Mo. Um, Seth Berger is one of my friends. He's one of the founders of, of And One. He's now at West Town School around the corner. Uh, still is actually active in my kids' lives and and I'm active in his kids' lives. That's amazing. About, you know, being in Philly for the last couple of decades yeah. and growing up and raising a family in the sports town, what do you think makes this town so special? Why, why, why are sports so uh, important in this community? Yeah. So I was a Navy kid. I moved almost every single year. I didn't really have a hometown until I came here. And it was really important to me to grow my kids in one place so that they could feel like that they had a sense of place. Uh, and I couldn't have been more fortunate to land here because this this city and in Camden, they have such soul. They have such grit, you know, um, and the people who are here and the teams that are here, you know, embody, I think, everything that is awesome about being uh, an American. Uh, and so I'm just really proud that I got the chance to grow here uh, as a young person and and to stay here. Where at our practice facility, have you walked around at all? I don't know. Have you, not okay. had the chance to walk around. Because we have all these like mantras written around. And like one of the things Brett is big on our coaches. Uh, like Philly hard, mm-hmm, Philly mm-hmm, real. Mm-hmm. We actually talked about it this morning. He told us that we were uh, being soft. <laughs> and uh, Philly doesn't sort of, he, Yeah, he sort of, <laughs> he sort of gave us <laughs> the business about that. But just, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a hardness, there's a passion, there's a grit that this town has. And as an athlete playing here, um, it makes it a really special experience. We hold you to high standards. Yeah. I, I said fans. I said last year <laughs> I said last year it's a unique experience. <laughs> you know, because there are days, games where, you know, you're walking off the court at halftime and you're getting a chorus of booze and you know, you have to be mentally tough enough to accept that. <laughs> yeah, 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 we do have high expectations <laughs> for everybody <laughs> here, I think. Uh, and I think that's part of the charm of our city. So I'm curious about your transition from uh, essentially a a private citizen into a public figure over the last basically two years. Um, And as as an aside to that, if you're on Twitter or social media and you or, you know, your campaign manager uh, handles those accounts, how have you sort of seen interactions on those platforms change as you became a public figure? It has been a, a bizarre evolution for me because you're right. I'm kind of a really super private person and, and actually an introverted person at that. And so having to evolve into a more public figure where it's gotten recently, um, particularly to the point where I can't go to dinner or walk on the trail or go for a run without inevitably somebody in my community saying something kind or sometimes not <laughs> kind uh, to me. And I actually would love to get your advice on that because having never thought that this would be my life, yeah. um, it is uh, eerie. 
It's uh, mm-hmm. uh, I I don't know how much further this is going to go. It's <laughs> a little w- bit worrisome. Yeah, uh, but yeah, the Twitter and the Facebook um, conversations sometimes are unkind and sometimes are incredibly heartening. Uh, I had one other candidate give me some terrific advice. She her analogy was Sasha Fierce and just talking about like you need to be Chrissy Houlihan for Congress is like a persona, you know, versus yeah. Chrissy Houlihan. Um, and so you just have to put that armor on. I think that's that's good advice. I actually, first of all, you you cannot delete your social media accounts. I deleted all of my social media <laughs> accounts. Well done. Um, well done. Yeah, <laughs> but for a bunch of different reasons. Um, I even deleted my private ones. But I always tell people because you know, I'll let's say I'm walking in Brooklyn or walking in Philly or you know, leaving the hotel on the road, and you know, you you get asked for a picture, selfie, autograph, somebody screams across the street at you, whatever it may be. And people will be with me and they'll be like, hey, does you know, does that ever get annoying? Does that ever get old? Mm-hmm. And I think as I've gotten older, what I've realized is if I'm not at home, if I leave the house, then I have to just expect to be on. You have to just kind of turn a switch on and realize you're going to have interactions with people. And, and how do you want yeah. You know, to represent yourself yeah. in those interactions. And yeah. so you're, you you choose to be kind, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. even if other people are not necessarily being kind, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you just choose to be on and you choose to be kind. And, and there's really no way anybody can have a bad interaction mm-hmm. with you. Now, you could maybe have a bad interaction mm-hmm, with them, mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. you know. What's interesting being kind of a woman candidate and is particularly one with a, a heritage and back, background like mine, where I spent the better part of my life showing up to work in sweats. Um, you know, now I have to show up to life looking congressional or whatever everybody's version of congressional is. And for women candidates, that seems to be a fairly high bar. Um, and so I feel like that I can't even go to the grocery store without feeling like, what do I need to put on? You know, uh, and that's a very odd thing for me as, as mm-hmm. kind of who I was before all of this. Um, which I hope that you don't have to do. I feel like you could probably walk out the door and whatever you want. I was in sweats all day yesterday. <laughs> I'm so jealous. <laughs> but they were 76 or sweats. So. <laughs> they were on brand. Good. Well, I mean, I think you, up until recently, you were essentially, I think I'm using your words, yeah. I hope here, yeah. but you were essentially a soccer mom, you know, for a, for a period of Although time. Although I can't stand soccer. Yeah. yeah. And my kids hated it too. So I, yeah, I would imagine that that transition mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. is rough. Mm-hmm. Um, education is really important to me. Mm-hmm. I know it's one of the things mm-hmm. that you're sort of running on. Yep. I have a few questions about education because as a dad, you know, this is sort of one of the things that I think a lot about yep. with my kids. There's actually three things that I want to ask you about in, in in relation to my kids, but specifically with your experience for for Teach for America. What motivated you to do that? Yeah. At, at the age you were at, because mm-hmm. typically that's something mm-hmm. that kids do right mm-hmm. out of college mm-hmm. or in their early yeah. 20s yeah. and then kind of go get their consulting jobs at McKinsey after yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> you're on to it. Yeah, that is the path usually. So I was motivated to do it because at And One, um, we actually had a really aggressive philanthropic effort. Five percent of our profits were always given to education-based philanthropic uh, organizations because we knew that kids who wanted to wear our gear wanted to be professional ball players or thought that aspired to that, but would really genuinely need a good education. Yeah. And that was fundamental to who we were as a brand and who we were as a, as a community. And so we also had 40 hours of community service that we gave to everyone that was paid every year. Uh, and with my 40 hours of community service, I always gave back with teaching either women and girls in math and science or underserved communities, particularly in math and science is kind of my pa- passion And so when I got to the point as a 40-something, 45-year-old person, where I really wanted to turn my professional ability into helping in education, and at that point in time, I thought that our big crisis was in education. Now I think it's somewhere else. Um, That I thought that the best way for me to be helpful from a business perspective in education was to first be an educator. Uh, And I think at And One, it was similar. I started as one of six or seven people at that organization, and I knew Everything. I knew every job by the time I got to be, you know, the head of whatever. Um, and so by being first a teacher to be able to help teachers, I thought that was a correct thing to do. And for a 45 year old woman, the best way to get to, to a class was Teach for America. Uh, and I wanted to teach science. So I taught chemistry and I went to Gratz. And I, unbelievably or not unbelievably, Gratz was one of the uh, teams that we outfitted when I was at And One. And so kind of to come full circle and to be, you know, in a very storied gym, you know, at a very storied school 
school with a huge basketball heritage and be teaching 11th grade chemistry at the same time that my 10th grader was taking chemistry down the road uh, gave me a really great insight into the difference and disparity between what my child was being given and asked to learn and what the kids I was teaching were being given and asked to learn. And what I learned is, first of all, teachers are amazing uh, and the kids are amazing too. But my kids at Gratz were really disadvantaged on so many levels, but primarily because they were reading at about the third or fourth grade level and being asked to take chemistry at the 11th grade level. And that couldn't be reconciled. And that's effectively why I decided if I'm going to use my business background to help in education where I would be best used is in literacy. So I found an organization that was founded by another Teach for America guy, and he was focusing on pre-K through fourth grade kids and that, that you know, learn to read by fourth grade kind of emphasis. And that's where I knew how to grow companies. He knew an idea that worked, and we helped to scale that organization. That company now is a nonprofit. Uh, this last summer served almost 7,000 kids across the nation. So it's a now a national program. All right, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsor. Buying tickets can be complicated and confusing, but there is a simpler way to buy with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to every type of live event. Whether you're catching your favorite musician on tour, shopping for the perfect gift, or searching for a last-minute deal to see your favorite NBA team, SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices, fully guaranteed. Nothing beats being there in person for the biggest plays of the year, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone, and it's by far the easiest way I've found to shop for tickets. I can be anywhere, and with just a few taps, I can instantly find seats. I actually just used SeatGeek to buy tickets to Oklahoma the other day. And by Oklahoma, I don't mean a football game. I do mean the play. SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever. SeatGeek saves you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find amazing deals. And to get you the most bang for your buck, SeatGeek grades every ticket based on value to help you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket, from sports and concerts to comedy and theater. Best of all, my listeners get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code JJ today. That's promo code JJ for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, right seat, right now, right from your phone. And now back to my conversation with Chrissy Houlihan. How can the government enact policies that actually would help early education? I'm I'm going through a process right now with my oldest where we're applying to private schools, K through 12 in in Brooklyn and Manhattan. And um, same as you, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, if, if Knox gets into one of these schools, he'll immediately have a leg up mm-hmm. on a lot of his mm-hmm. peers mm-hmm. who maybe don't get a chance at that mm-hmm. sort of early education. Mm-hmm. So there are many things that the government can do, some at the national, some at the state, and some at the local level to level the playing field for kids. Um, at the national level, until this recent presidential election, we actually, in a bipartisan manner, were heading in the right direction, I thought, in emphasizing the importance of early childhood development and um, early childhood education. They couldn't be more important, sort of birth to, let's call it second, third grade, are the really critical years. And that's where we should be investing at a national level, at a state level, and at a local level in our future. Uh, and we were recognizing that, I thought, pretty well um, up and until this most recent administration. And, and now that's being undermined and that those really important uh, funding mechanisms are no longer as prevalent. Um, the other thing that we can do for kids, it was a lesson that I learned when I was uh, teaching and then afterwards, is it's beyond what's happening within the four walls of a classroom or, or within the four walls of a, a early Head Start you know, program or something like that. It has to do with all the other things that that child is being pressured with, whether they can see well so that they can see the chalkboard, you know, whether they can eat well, whether they have a full stomach when they get to class, whether they're afraid because their community is dangerous, you know, whether um, their parents have accessible, uh, quality, and affordable child care. Um, those kinds of things are the other things that are beyond the walls of the school. And I, you know, I have a military heritage and we have this thing of like, leave no person behind, leave no man behind. 
we leave people behind in this society and we have the ability to elevate them and to provide them the foundation so that when they walk into a classroom, when they step into a classroom, that they can learn. You mentioned education being the number one crisis, <clears throat> or it was. Mm-hmm. What, is, what do you think the number one crisis is right now? Uh, decency. <laughs> um I'm laughing because you're you're right. It's, it's, it's like the uncomfortable laugh yeah. when you're yeah. you're just like you're sick to your stomach yeah. about it. I yeah. just I can't anymore. I just you can't. know we've gone this. How long have we been talking, Randy? Twenty eight minutes. minutes, and we have not vilified a single soul yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're being decent, I think. <laughs> How about that? It turns out you can do that. Yeah, uh, and and you can still communicate, and you can still collaborate. So. Beyond just running and beyond just saying we need decency, how do you bring about decency? Sure. How do you enact decency? Sure. How do you get um, rhetoric, po- you know, policies, whatever it may be, where the government is actually supporting and mm-hmm. protecting mm-hmm. society's weakest members? Mm-hmm. Uh, I would argue a bunch of things. First, I would say uh, you elect Democrats. Um, <laughs> I think that we are— Certainly working very hard, at least this campaign has been for almost two years, to run a campaign about what we are for and uh, what we are positively moving towards. And in in uh, our, my campaign and in many others, it's quality and accessible and affordable health care. You know, it's a decent uh, job with a living wage and equal pay for equal work. Uh, and it's access to a quality education, equal education for everyone, uh, a safe planet, safe community, safe safe schools. Those are the things that you talk about when you're talking about decency. Um, Those are not partisan. Those aren't, you know, kind of like big D type issues. Those are little D type issues that I think we owe each other. Also, the other thing I would say is you lead by example. And so this campaign has been singularly focused on winning, but also on doing it with dignity and with class. And we have done that. And I have 10 more days to go, and I will make sure that we finish this with decency. And um, and I think that the last thing I'd leave you with is it's not just this campaign, but it's many across the country. There are a lot of people who are running as first-time candidates who've never done this before who have raised their hands for the very same reason that I raised mine. They're, they're veterans, they're women, they're STEM professionals, they're educators, they're different people than the normal politician, you know, normal path. And those people are uh, unified. I've gotten the chance to meet many of them on, and work with many of them through the last couple of years. And if a few of us make it through that gauntlet, I think yeah. that we will change the, the conversation. The, the badasses. The badasses. That's your call. Yeah, you know the badasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the badasses are just a, a subsection of all of these people. Okay, okay. About. The badasses are just the women veterans or women of service. I gotcha. Yeah, I gotcha. yeah. I gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. So as I was saying earlier, as a, as a father, and I'm sort of thinking about my kid's life, right? And I, like, There's three concerns that I have. Number one is education. Huh. Um you know, I don't know what jobs are actually going to be available to them mm. in 20, mm-hmm. 25, 30 mm-hmm. years. Like mm-hmm. you just you just have no way of knowing mm-hmm. with the way technology is moving. Mm-hmm. Climate change mm. is a real concern. Mm-hmm. Like, will the University of Miami in Coral Gables actually be an option for them to go to school? <laughs> or will it be underwater? <laughs> well, you need diving equipment to do that. Um and and gun violence. Like mm-hmm. those those are the three things mm-hmm. that I think as a dad that I think about the most. I want to ask you about sort of climate change and global warming and all that stuff, because I think one of the things you're sort of running on is uh, education, of course, um, securing our country and economic growth. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges with economic growth is balancing regulation and, you know, climate change. Sure, There's all these things happening and, you know, no one can sort of agree on, What's right or what's wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a there was a, a, a Sam Harris podcast about the wizard and or the Freakonomics about the wizard and the prophet, mm-hmm. um, and and who's sort of going to be right mm-hmm. in this whole mm-hmm. debate on global warming. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So where do you sort of see yourself in 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 that? Yeah, and it's really a critical issue. And you know, I was struck over the last couple of weeks by a 
couple of things that came together on that topic of climate change and global warming, whichever one you choose to use. The DOD believes it's real. Uh, they're building uh, warships and bases and power plants because they are worried that not only do they need to evolve as, as a defense department, but the threat is evolving and it's causing mass migrations of humans. It's causing, you know, pressure and, and threats to our country, to the planet. Um, so the DOD thinks that climate change is real. Exxon Mobil just recently came out and said, you know what, it might be real. And we're going to not only tell you that it's real, but we're going to talk about carbon, you know, trade and, and carbon caps, which is interesting. We saw the UN say that we're we're doomed. You know, we, we, we see everywhere that we're doomed except for at our current administration and the current, you know, organization that is charged with worrying about protecting the environment currently is denying that this is something they need to be worried about. about the EPA. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so I believe obviously climate change is real. I believe that humans cause it. I believe that we need to be actively moving as aggressively as possible towards, you know, reducing, uh, the threat to the climate. But I also, think that one of the biggest levers that we do have is the for-profit sector of the economy. You know, 80% of our economy in our country is driven by for-profit companies. And for about four or five years of my of my adulthood, I, I worked in an organization that focused on harnessing the power of for-profit companies to do better, to do better for the planet, to do better for their employees, to do better for their communities. Benefit Corporation is what this concept was is called. And basically the idea that for-profit companies should be given the latitude to the permission to be able to consider those kinds of things is a new concept, relatively new concept. And as a consequence of this benefit corporation movement, you can now incorporate your for-profit company as a B Corp and consider things like the planet and your everyday business decisions or at your inflection points, like when you sell a company. And I think that we're seeing increasingly businesses take responsibility too, uh, even if our government is no longer if, is abdicating that responsibility. I'm seeing businesses step up to the plate and worry about that. They're doing it because it's good for business. Consumers are interested in responsibility. Their investors are interested in social responsibility. And I think that they're realizing that they need to be participating in solutions because it's good for their business. It's good for their profits. So I think that what I've seen that heartens me is that businesses are moving, I think, in the right direction largely. And I'm also seeing local communities just rise up and say, you know what, if my state government's not going to do something, if my national government's going to turn their backs on this, then we're going to add advocate from the grassroots, and we're going to make sure that people are paying attention. Uh, And the last thing is, and we're going to vote as individuals. You know, we're going to find people who believe that this is real and believe that this is um, a threat, Um, not just to sort of whether we're going to be here long term, but uh, literally a national threat as well. And so I think that voting is the last thing that we have that we should be doing to make sure that we're putting people in office who believe in this stuff. Yeah. Um, So. I uh, had the opportunity this past August to meet with um, a group of students, um, March for Our Lives, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, probably the most notable, Emma Gonzalez and Lauren and David Hogg. But this group now has students from all over the country, not just Parkland, Florida, um, St. Louis, Chicago, South Central LA, communities that have been sort of ravaged by gun violence. And um, I'm curious... in the last two years as, you, as you've been campaigning, how big of an issue with voters gun control is? It's a big issue, uh, and it has become a much bigger one over the course of the two years that I've been running. Um, when I started this journey, I was sort of given the advice, quiet advice, that it, as a Democrat in my community, which is a purple place, you know, 50% Republican, 50% Democrat, that you really shouldn't talk about guns and gun safety and gun violence, that it wasn't a winning issue. It wasn't something that people in my community wanted to hear, and it would frankly lose you an election if you talked about it. Uh, in early days, we decided that we weren't going to to let that pass. You know, if I'm not the right representative because of my positions on guns and gun safety, um, then I'm not your person. But I have a unique ability to talk about this issue because I'm a veteran, because I'm third generation military, and because I've been an educator in a very, very difficult community where I walked through gun and metal detectors every single day, and so did my kids. And if I can't talk about this and say that, the, you know, that there are common sense things that we can do to be safer, then who can? Um, and so that's why pretty early days we decided to embrace this is one of our bigger messages. And sadly, events caught up with that. Uh, and our kids 
uh, high school aged kids became really energized and activated about Parkland and other places. And they came and basically shamed the adults and said, you know, we're, we're the ones in the crowd who are behaving like grownups and, and the adults are walking away from this responsibility. Uh, and so those have been some of the most active people participating in my campaign either as volunteers or otherwise. And many of them aren't old enough to vote. And they're still out there knocking doors and making phone calls and making sure that people show up and and advocate for change. Because you're running for political office, you seem like no better person to ask this question to. And this is a question I ask a lot of people. But why? (laughs) Why, why is the Second Amendment such a hot button topic, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I think that there are basic tenets in our democracy that are, relatively speaking, immutable. And the First Amendment is one of them, and the Second Amendment is a, is a second. And I think that people understandably get a little bit upset when they feel as though something that's a guaranteed right in their mind is possibly going to be taken away from them. I think what we have to explain at this is that this isn't really a slippery slope. We're not talking about wholesale huge changes. Yeah. We're just talking about common sense things. You know, we're talking about background checks. We're talking about making sure that we have mental health care and mental health and, you know, insurance. We're talking about being able to research why this is happening, why this is an epidemic of violence. You know, these are not radical ideas. Uh, these are just ideas that will be, allow our schools to be safer and our communities to be safer. The, the last thing. So, I, I know you said you're like you're on social media, yeah. and like one of the reasons that I I got off was sort of the way the feeds work, right? So these algorithms sort of curate mm-hmm. a message to mm-hmm. you, and mm-hmm. you know if you get on Twitter or Instagram, mm-hmm. you know they're essentially telling you what to read, mm-hmm. and um, if uh, like me, you know you follow a bunch of liberal journalists mm-hmm. and liberal politicians, mm-hmm. uh, then you're essentially getting. Mm -hmm. one version of Mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. And for anyone else, you're getting another version of reality. And it's interesting that when the left sort of says like, we're going to, we're going to look out for the weakest members, you know, Mm -hmm. you're talking about Mm -hmm. immigrants, Mm -hmm. uh, people of color, Mm -hmm. people from disadvantaged Mm -hmm. uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. You know, we, we often don't think about the people who lost their mining jobs or manufacturing jobs in Ohio or West Virginia. Um, And I love that you said your district is a, is a purple district Mm -hmm. and you seem like your, your goal is to sort of be as bipartisan as Mm -hmm. possible, but how do you actually sort of bridge that gap and, and, and reach and kind of, get away from from tribalism. Right. And that's, you know, you try not to silo people into buckets. Although, uh, example for me personally, LGBTQ issues are personally very important to me. And I, and I really want to talk about those issues and to worry about it, those issues. I don't want to legislate, you know, for everybody across that one area. Everybody should be treated fairly with equal opportunity for everyone. Um, And I think when you have a conversation about that, then you aren't leaving anyone behind because you're right. You know, we clearly missed something. One of the things I needed to come to grips with after the election of 2016 is I really missed something big. You know, I thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win and I thought that that's what was going to happen. And clearly it not only didn't happen, but it didn't happen in Pennsylvania in my neighborhood, you know? And so I was clearly missing something very large that I needed to reconcile, which is that there's pain out there. And I don't, I refuse to believe that what I missed was a bunch of misogynists and racists. I I refuse to believe that. I think there was real pain. And I think people were, an analogy I heard was fourth stage cancer patients. And they had taken, you know, the blue pill at one point for President Obama and it didn't work for them. And they were going to take the red pill because they still were dying of cancer, you know. And I think that they, they, they I have to view the world that way and, and view that this is about a conversation about opportunity for all. Right. Um, so, well, best of luck. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful. I, well. I'm, I'm registered uh, in New York State, so yeah. I, won't, I won't be voting in, yeah. in Pennsylvania, but yeah. uh, best you of luck. You could use your vote. Oh. I know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, 11 more days. <laughs> so tell your friends. I everywhere. will. Anyone who's listening from Philly. Well, you know, we have a big, we have people from Philly uh, listen to this podcast because, uh, you know, we have yeah. 76ers guys on. So yeah. um, I'm sure you'll have their vote. Absolutely. Well, thank All you. Right. I appreciate that. So what I would tell them, anyone yeah. from Pennsylvania, that there is an opportunity if you're interested in volunteering for padems.com slash volunteer or else, elsewhere for Vote Save America. 
which okay. also will help you find places to be helpful. Okay. And you can vote on November 6th. Yep. All right. All day. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. All right. That's it for this week's episode of the JJ Reddick Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, We'll be back soon with more episodes. Uh, If you have any questions or comments, hit up The Ringer at Ringer on Twitter or Instagram. Thanks so much. All right, and please don't forget about the upcoming Showtime sports documentary series, Shut Up and Dribble, featuring exclusive interviews with the Big O, Oscar Robertson, Bill Walton, Sir Charles Barkley, Bad Boys Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer, Chris Bosh, Meta World Peace, Draymond Green, KD, and King James himself. Shut Up and Dribble starts streaming this Saturday, only on Showtime. Give it a watch.